online so far. And I believe we're expecting uh, several more to come in. Yes, yes. Am I audible, Gautam? Yes, yes, you're audible as well as visible properly. Oh, okay, very good. Okay. Very good. It's nice to see you back after a long time. I'm sorry. Oh, back. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's right. Uh, That's right. Is Ima present here? Yes, I find Ima here. Yeah, good time. Sorry. Okay. okay. Hi. Hi, John. How are you? Hi. Hi, Ima. I'm fine. <laughs> How are you? Yeah. Uh, I'm fine. Nice um, to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. Tomorrow, actually, in Indonesia, we celebrate the holy holiday for Muslim. So that uh, this night, many celebration here. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, which holiday is it now in um, Indonesia? It Peter. Uh, sorry, it um. Uh -huh. Adaha, yes. Idolata. Okay. Yes, okay. Idolata. Ah, oh, yeah, I remember that you can speak Bahasa. It was uh, a mm, <laughs> Pass. A little. Sedicate, yeah. sedicate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do remember the... the... So, uh, good morning to John, sir, and uh, good evening uh, to all the participants from India, and good evening to all the participants from Indonesia. So today we have uh, we are here to uh, attend one a creative uh, writing workshop on poetry and environment, and this workshop is uh, being conducted uh, by Department of English, Shadhan Chandra Mohabedala, in collaboration with Varshitet Sarajana Siswa University, or in South USP. So. Uh, in this workshop, we have got a great, uh, as well as renowned professor, uh, Professor John Charles Ryan, and he's a great man. And he is going to be your felicitator uh, in this workshop. And this workshop, the concept note has already have gone through. This would be a one hour and a one hour creative writing workshop. We'll introduce students to nature poetry through practical exercises designed to encourage personal creativity and an appreciation of the environment in an age of increasing ecological disruption. Writing exercises will help students serpent their senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch, and uh, kinesthetics to gain deeper connection with and insight into the complexities of the natural world. Rather than a lecture format, the workshop will be interactive. Through a series of exercises, the facilitator will guide students in writing about a place that is meaningful to them. An open mic reading at the end of the session will give participants the opportunity to read their work. So this is the concept of this uh, workshop. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor John and I'd like to say about him a few words because uh, he has a long CD and more than 25 pages. So it would not be possible for us to read that one. So uh, Professor John Charles Ryan is a writer of uh, nonfiction, short fiction and research uh, with an interest in plant life. His publications include the poetry collections to with nature and seeing trees, a poetic arboretum, as well as a prose anthology, The Mind of the Plants. Narratives of Vegetable yeah. Intelligence. In May 2023, his botanical persona poems were included in the exhibition, The Power of Plants and Ancient Vitality at Bing Art Museum in Shanghai, China. Uh, currently, Professor Ryan uh, is an adjunct associate professor at Southern Cross University, Australia. So before officially welcoming uh, uh, Professor John on this platform and to start this workshop, so I'd like to request our honorable principal sir is with us right now, Dr. Uh, Sheikh Kujulil Hawk. So sir, could you hear me? So if you can hear me, could you say a few words about this workshop? I think he's connecting his audio. Yes, correct. Bear with us, our honorable principal, sir, Dr. A.C. Falk of Shadon Chandra Mohabidala. So I'd like to request him to say a few words on this workshop. Uh, thank you, Gautam. Welcome, sir. Good evening. 
it is a great pleasure for me and also our college sadun chandra mahavidyalay to organize such a workshop the title of this workshop is a creative writing workshop on poetry and the environment conducted by the department of english of our college along with in collaboration with university sarjana e rata tamasaniya orthat that is usm indonesia i feel a great pleasure to collaborate with the university ust for organizing such a such an work such a workshop in this workshop professor john charles rian adjunct associate professor southern cross university australia will deliver his valuable lecture on this topic i am our college and also our college is grateful to him for spending his valuable time for giving such a talk i expect that the this talk will enrich to all participants in this webinar workshop thank you very much uh, thank you so much sir for your wonderful uh, talk on this workshop and your uh, help to organize this one and uh, from uh, ust i requested uh, our honorable vice director ma'am to be present but unfortunately uh, she cannot join this uh, workshop so i let you uh, ask ima to say a few words on this workshop then we'll go to professor john ryan to begin his session oh, okay okay thank you gautam um thank you mr huck and also john for this opportunity and of course for you gautam because uh, we can uh, you can make it actually you can make it um you you. yeah on behalf of university uh, sorry universita sarjana vyatataman siswa we we'll like to probably thank you for all these things and uh, hopefully for the next next step we can have the Thank great you, no, move the great move not only in the uh, workshop or seminar we can go through the uh, community services and publication that's it okay thank you gotan because uh, i believe that everybody here actually uh, curious all to what ryan will talk about thank you thank you ma for your wonderful words and now uh, this is the time which we have been waiting for a long time to have this workshop present and uh, we have professor john ryan so i'd like to officially welcome him on our virtual platform so sir please you can begin the workshop and i also wish uh, best of luck to all the participants who are here i hope you will have an interesting session with professor john thank you okay thank you very much gotham uh thank you abu uh, ima and thank you very much dr hawk for the very warm welcome. I'm so happy to see participants from India and Indonesia, two countries I love so much. Uh, I've, of course, lived in Indonesia for several years. I've yet to visit India in person, but I look forward to that day. So I'm very, very uh, delighted that um, you all can join us. And so let me share my screen with you now, and we will get the, uh, the workshop going. And so just one minute, please. Okay. Okay, so as, uh, as we have already heard, our focus today is on poetry and the environment. And so rather than a lecture format, this is going to be an interactive seminar or even a workshop. A workshop, of course, is a, a session in which you create something. So it won't be a, a, simply a matter of listening to me speak about 
poetry in the environment, you will be creating some works of poetry that deal with the environment. So I hope you're uh, looking forward to that. Um, once again, I'm John Ryan. I am affiliated with a, an Australian university called Southern Cross University in New South Wales. I'm very, very pleased to, to join you today. So I'm primarily a writer of poetry, nonfiction, and short fiction and journalistic research. So um, I write poetry primarily about the natural world and specifically about plant life and botany, the science of botany. Um, nonfiction, uh, short nonfiction, sometimes this is called narrative nonfiction, right? So nonfiction deals with actual events, right? As in contrast to fiction, which tends to be uh, created out of the writer's imagination. So by short fiction, I mean short stories. And uh, lastly, by journalistic research, I'm talking about um, writing that covers aspects of aspects of research that's done in an academic setting. So I cover those four genres of uh, writing. But today we're focusing on poetry. What I would like to do is, is read two of my poems and give you uh, some background information uh, on those poems to introduce the idea of a persona poem, which is our focus today. That's the tool that I hope you will take from today's session, the writing tool. So this is called Giant Tree in a Field. In this labyrinth of cattle and goats, I am watching. As you cross the fence and enter this field, I am watching. I am the tentacles of this winter ground preparing to enclose you. Tell me, is today the day when the southern wind is blowing? Tell me, is today the day when the stacked stones will topple? I was once water flowing around stone. I hardened in waiting. The ribbons of tumbling water toughened to ligaments and bones. My leaves agreed with the stones, sand, stars, and sun watching. My grazers ward off the other trees. Goats manicure this leafy gloss. When will my inner fruits ripen? When will my wasps cease waiting? From this rock-modeled rise, I shepherd the slow spasms of seasons. New families come, children mature, they leave. Left, I am waiting. My purpling roots spider their dark blood, lean in. Soothe my callous skin with your touch, breathe in, watching. So this is a poem written in response to this tree, an old tree in a field in Australia. Uh, this is a, a kind of fig tree ficus or in Indonesia beringen right so it's a it's a tree with a, a long cultural history so this tree is alone in the field it's uh, an old tree so it survives many decades in this state it's watched people come and go it's watched animals uh, graze its leaves it's been a witness to the seasons. It's been a witness to the transformation of the environment. So that, that's how an image, a photograph in this instance, can inspire a poem. Okay, and, I'll, and so the other point I want to make is that the poem uh, uses the uh, I position quite extensively. I, I, I watch. That position is from the perspective of the tree. And that's what a persona poem does. It provides a perspective from uh, something or someone else uh, other than the writer. Okay, so I'll give you another example, a slightly different poem. This is a poem uh, that's written with a particular physical form, right? It, it sort of looks like half a tree. And this is a poem called, um, whoops, a tree caged, a tree caged. So protected from theft 
in an iron cage on a lawn, in plain view of tame deer who lurk behind metal fences, leave me to be with my 200 million year old sensations in thorny branches that germinate my father's seeds. I am a relic of the era before time, my deep valleys of memory, I ask that you avoid them at all costs, because there are dangers in remembering that are more terrifying than anything possible in this world. Your unimaginable edge, the one I hurl myself over. Okay, and so to understand uh, this poem, uh, we need to look at this image, which is of the world's oldest tree species. Uh, this is the Wallamy pine, W-O-L-L-E-M-I, the Wallamy pine. Um, this species of tree was discovered 100 miles from the center of Sydney in a, a, a remote canyon uh, just west of Sydney and Australia. So this is the oldest species of tree. This tree itself that you're seeing here may be fairly young, but the species itself dates back to the dinosaurs in sort of the very, very old era. Um, so <clears throat> you may be asking, well, why is there a fence around this tree? Uh, is it because uh, the, in this case, the kangaroos or the domestic deer uh, in this uh, lawn, which is in Australia, might come and graze the tree? That's only half the truth. The fact is <clears throat> that this tree is so valuable, it often has to be guarded. So in this case, the fence around the tree uh, prevents people from coming by, digging up the tree, and perhaps selling it. Because it's a valuable tree, it's in demand, perhaps a private collector would like to buy this tree. And so that is why this tree is caged, right? So the natural world has all of these very interesting stories, and my hope uh, is that today you might explore some of the own some of your own stories that you have for particular places and particular uh, beings in the natural world. Now, poetry taps into the subconscious, right? We have the conscious mind. We have the unconscious mind when we're sleeping, but we also can think of the subconscious mind, the kinds of mental activities that go on uh, just below the conscious level. So I believe that poetry taps into that subconscious mind, right? And so to get you started, I'd like to begin with a, what's called a very short attuning exercise or even a grounding exercise. So our lives are incredibly busy, right? They're incredibly hectic. Uh, we, are, we tend to be on social media quite extensively for our family lives, friend, with our friends, and also for our work lives. But there can be great power simply in taking a few minutes, closing our eyes, quieting our mind, and opening our senses to what is around us. And so I'd like to begin with this very short exercise. This is a grounding exercise, and I'll invite you for a couple minutes now to close your eyes, which you can do now, and focus on your breath. Now, as you focus on your breath, try to attune to where you are, right? So despite the virtual format we find ourselves in, each of us is connected physically to a place at this very moment. That place may be a bedroom, but if we broaden our sense of place, we may understand that we're connected to a region and that that region may be defined by a river or a mountain, right? If you're in Jogjakarta, uh, you're very much uh, aware of the mountain uh, in that area, the sacred mountain. And I think that's true of many other places. So we are all connected to a place at this moment. So with your eyes closed, tune in to the senses. What are you hearing? What are you feeling? What might you smell? 
what might you even taste, right? So let's take a, a minute or so and just attune into that. So just a short segue into our writing, but for those of you who might uh, have a practice of meditation or prayer or, or Tai Chi or whatever it may be, uh, this, of course, will be familiar to you. Right? So um, with that, uh, let us look at uh, what a persona poem is. And that's going to be the, the focus of today's session. So you will practice writing a, your own persona poem. But what is a persona poem? Right? In literature, uh, whether it's a novel, a short story, play, or poem, a persona refers to a character in that literary work. Right? It's a character, simply, in a literary work. It's a voice in that literary work. Right. So a persona, persona poem uses the first person I to speak from the perspective of someone or something else. And there are great persona poems in the history of English language literature. Right. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, maybe a male poet who is writing from the perspective of a woman or a female poet writing from the perspective of a man. Okay, so those are persona poems. When, when the poet uses an, an I position, speaking from the first per person perspective, uh, from the perspective of something or someone else. So let's, with that persona poem idea, combine it with the nature poem. A nature poem is one that celebrates the beauty and wonder of the natural world while making us aware of ecological problems, right? So nature poems are, might take a focus on a particular place, a river, a mountain, uh, the beauty, wonder, and mystery of that place. But in the, in the contemporary time, nature poems deal to a great extent with ecological problems. You're probably aware of climate change. Uh, you're, you may be aware of species loss, the great tragedy of biodiversity decline, right? Uh, you may be aware of the struggles of indigenous people to preserve their traditional lands. So late nature poems to a great extent nowadays deal with those kinds of problems. So let's bring those two concepts together requires also empathy, empathy, right? Empathy is the great value of our age because it is a strong identification with someone or something. So this sort of practice develops empathy. It develops identification and it's exercising your imagination to a great extent. So the nature persona poem. Are there any questions about the nature persona poem. If you have any, uh, just write them in the chat or uh, 
Yes, yes, right. So one comment uh, similar to mindfulness meditation. Yes, exactly. So becoming mindful of our senses, right? We tend to be vision dominated. So this sort of activity can allow us to uh, tune into our other senses as well. Uh, a question, what's the difference between romantic era poetry and nature poetry? Romantic era poetry uh, refers to poetry written during the romantic era, which is sort of the late uh, 19th centuries, especially in Britain, although there were there was a period of German romanticism uh, and even arguably American romanticism. So <clears throat> in contrast to that, Romantic era poetry, which is an historical designation, nature poetry is more of a genre. So nature I love visiting uh, Asia and Southeast Asia in particular because there's a um, uh, great, you know, uh, great uh, selection of matcha to try in many places, farms, green tea, green tea farms and tea plantations in many places. So this is a brand of matcha called Pure Chimp. And you can see that the writing adopts an eye perspective. Why me? I'm pesticide free and I have a lovely, delicate green tea taste. Some people say I taste like a cross between green tea and black tea. That is an example of persona writing, right? So this writing is from the perspective of the green tea. Um, so that's how you might convert your creative writing passions into a career uh, that is not necessarily related to writing novels and poetry, but which demands uh, creative writing with, in this case, advertising, marketing, and product um, product development. Okay, so one example of uh, persona writing from the from the uh, non literary world. Okay, so now I need your input, uh, and this is this is what I will do. I will give you three examples of persona poems, okay? And what I will do is open a poll in Zoom. And I'll do that now, in fact. And I want you to vote on which is your favorite, okay? So if you click poll in your tab there at the bottom in Zoom, you should see three choices. Uh, the first is Luis Gluck, The Wild Iris. The second is Craig Santos Perez, Wild Piper. Oh, don't vote yet <laughs> until you hear them or uh, hear the three poems. Uh, and uh, unless you've already already read those in the in the handout, that's fine too. And uh, thirdly, Anthony Fabo, which is a performance poem. All right, so uh, perhaps you've already read those poems or listened to the poem in the case of Ant Anthony Fabo's poem. I'd like you to vote, which is your favorite and think about why that poem is your favorite. Because to become a creative writer requires being aware of what your preferences are. Why do you like a particular poem? What elements specifically do you like? How can you incorporate those elements into your own writing? So becoming a writer is also a matter of becoming a critic and identifying what you like, what you like less, and what you might be able to adopt or even adapt from poems you're reading. All right, so I will now present these three poems, and I ask you to vote on your favorite. And in the chat, uh, type why that poem is your favorite. Be as specific as possible. It could be that you appreciate the particular language the poet is using. Uh, it could be uh, the topic, the subject matter. It could be the voice of the poem, uh, the, of the, the speaker in the poem. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do this. So I will read these three poems. Let's begin with Luis Gluck, who is an American writer. 
in this poem, she is writing from the perspective of a plant called the wild iris. This is a garden plant, okay? So this is the voice of this plant. At the end of my suffering, there was a door. Hear me out. That which you call death, I remember. Overhead, noises, branches of the pine shifting, then nothing. The weak sun flickered over the dry surface. It is terrible to survive as consciousness buried in the dark earth. When it was over, that which you fear, being a soul and unable to speak, ending abruptly, the stiff earth bending a little, and what I took to be birds darting in low shrubs. You who do not remember passage from the other world, I tell you, I could speak again. Whatever returns from oblivion returns to find a voice. From the center of my life came a great fountain, deep blue shadows on azure seawater. Okay, so that's number one, Luis Gluck, the wild iris. And this is number two, Craig Santos Perez, who is a Guam poet from Guam and who writes about his traditional um, uh, culture of the traditional culture of Guam. And in this poem, he's writing about uh, ancestral knowledge and relations to plants in Guam. So some of the language will be from the Chamorro language, right? Uh, some of the terms. Chamorro is the language of Guam. So these terms come from that language, okay? Wild Piper, another plant. The first Iemtis who found me in the deep jungle bowed to my branches, called me Sena, and shared stories of her sick village. I pitied them, no roots, fragile bark, prone to illness and pain. They weep like no other wounded animal on this island. So I gifted her my leaves to soothe her people. When the time came, I granted her permission to teach her daughter the places I grow, abundant what illnesses I treat, when to harvest. And this was how we grafted Itautau to Itano until doctors arrived and hospitals erected, until bulldozers uprooted our home, until militaries and toxins infected the soil, until barbed wire fences separated us, until E. Tauta Tano died from cancer and diabetes. After so much loss, the descendants of Yemetis are now returning to relearn my names and plant the sacred language of Amok back into their bodies so that we may grow perennially so that we may once again blossom and heal. All right, so that's poem number two, Craig Santos Perez. And poem number three is a performance poem. So I'm going to play um, the, the recording of the poet reading this poem. And um, just one second while I ensure that the sound will uh, also play. So this is a performance poem by Anthony Fabo. A poem told in the voice of the cat I stayed with for 10 days. Poem in the voice of the cat that I stayed with for 10 days. Day one. Meow. I don't know who you are, but you are not the person that loves me. There's a particular way that the things that I do here, your presence changes nothing. Day two. Oh, you're still here. I thought you would have left by now. People are constantly walking through these corridors. I pay no mind to them. You're no exception. Day three, you, sleeping in the bed that is not yours. Feed me. Do not think this interaction grants you permission to touch me. We all have to eat. Day four, I have assessed that you are no danger. Although you sit on my throne, I shall allow it. No blood shall be spilt on account of your ignorance. Just continue to meet my demands and you may stay. <laughs> I might even consider letting you caress my fur. Day five, oh, oh this is an outrage. I, I, I've never been so insulted in any of my lives. I, I, I threw they myself an invitation for you to hold me and you brush me off to the side like I'm some sort of dog, some, some alley cat, some stray off the street. Don't you know I am the decision maker here? Nothing changes if it does not suit me and you, well. <laughs> Let's just say, I've shared my disappointment in spots across the house. Day six. Fine. You are forgiven. 
I must say, your patience does astound me. Despite our debacle the night prior, you released a slight chuckle, cleaned up the mess, and even began reading again. Even apologized for not being more attentive. I have not seen this side of you before. I like it. <laughs> I'm sleeping on the bed tonight. Accept it, for it is a fact. Day, day seven. Mm. And to think, I've plotted ten different ways in which to eliminate you, but, but your hand on my back feel really nice. Now my ears, human, scratch behind my ears. Day eight. You are not the person I love, but there I found a spot on your chest that is warm, that is welcome home after being gone the whole day. When you sleep, I moonlight over your skin. That means touching my whiskers next to yours. I must make sure you are breathing. If not, who else will get my food? <laughs> Day nine. You are not the person that loves me, but you are water bowl reflection. You are paw print similar. You care about me more than these fans that come to adore me whenever the doors are open. Your intentions are pure. I thank you. Day 10. I woke up and you were not here. Had I known your hand on my stomach last night was, was to be our last moments together, I would have clawed at your wrist, made it more of a challenge, as everything worth loving should be. Great, so we had three very different persona poems. Uh, now it's your time to vote for your favorite and um, we have some feedback coming in already. The Wild Iris appeals to um, Shritanwi because of the contrasting images the poet uses, the profound aesthetic of survival. Yeah, and resilience shown even amidst the unbridled devastation of natural elements. Yeah, very good. Excellent. Yeah, so a great a poem very much about survival. Um, excellent. Yeah, so Wild Iris, one vote for that. Let's see what else we have. Um, yeah, Wild Iris is coming ahead in the polls. Uh, number two is Wild Piper. Number three is the performance poem, Anthony Febo, uh, performing the voice of the cat. So great. It looks like uh, I'll give you a couple. Well, just keep voting or keep thinking. Uh, I can return to that. But it looks like Wild Iris is ahead. Um, Boswat Wild Iris voting for Wild Iris because it talks about suffering, death, vivid use of imagery and metaphor. Yes, yes, very good. Yeah, excellent. Okay, yeah, we'll keep thinking about that as we progress. Um, why is it that you prefer certain poems um, over others, right? And so let us now uh, move into uh, writing about a particular uh, non-human being. Oops. Okay. So um, what I'd like you to do now is make a list of the animals, plants, insects, rocks, minerals, streams, rivers, or any other Okay, so you should have a, 
a, a short list of non-humans near you at this moment. And, and by non-humans, I mean uh, beings, so living living beings, right? Uh, not, not necessarily our printer or cell phone, uh, although they seem like they may be alive, especially with AI, um, but uh, non-human life forms. So uh, make a list uh, of those near you. And by near, you know, it, it's up to you. It could be your bedroom. It could be your yard, your your um, your um, immediate surroundings, or it could be your, your region, your local region. So um, you can define the scale. So now you have a list of non-humans near you. I would like you to select one non-human from your list, right? Select one from your list. And the word non-human is imperfect, right? Because it 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 shows a stark contrast between the human. So uh, we have human, and we have everything that's not human. But it's an imperfect term. But we'll use that for now. So please select one non-human from your list. You can highlight the term or underline it. And in the chat box, I'd like you to write um, where you're from. Uh, so where are you writing from? and which non-human you selected. Okay, so right now, uh, write those in the in the chat. And uh, yeah, so ants, bees, Teresa, um, writing uh, ants, bees, sugar, soft drink, soil. That's a, uh, remember, uh, a non-human being, so something that is alive, right? Good, so an ant would be a great one, a bee would be a great one. Um, Indian Gomahar tree, fantastic. Yeah, great selection. Small kitten, sprawling mango tree. Great, so um, so pick one of those to write about. Um, notebook, uh, notebook's not, not living. Maybe there's something living in your room. Could be a plant, insect, animal. Yeah. Indonesia, Ima from Indonesia, great. And a cat, okay, excellent. Yeah. So a few more minutes so select that one non-human indonesia crickets yes thank you lizard moving on the wall that's great great selection aloe vera plant in in kolkata terrific sparrow yes sparrow is a great one um to choose good 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 excellent so that that's right. That's correct. So pick that one non-human. And that is the uh, non-human that you are going to write about. Right. So so it looks like you're all doing getting making progress there. So white. Yes, a white page is is always always living. Yes. Okay. So feel free to pick uh, to pick the page. Uh, as your non-human. So an ant, uh, strong waves of the Indian Ocean, Desri, great. Nias Island, North Sumatra, fantastic. So the waves of the ocean. All right, good, good. So you've all selected something. Uh, now I'd like you to write about that. So we are looking at the six senses and we tend to think about five senses but in fact, there's uh, there are many more senses than five. Uh, there's of course seeing, there's hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and moving. Um, and the sixth sense is sometimes called kinesthesia or proprioception. Uh, I don't have I've combined it here with feeling, uh, but we can think about a sixth sense as what's known as proprioception or kinesthesia. That's very much like uh, the ability of a cat to balance itself when it falls. So it falls off uh, a desk, let's say, and somehow it writes itself in the air and lands on its feet. That is an example of kinesthesia. Uh, dancers have a great kinesthetic sense, um, ballerinas and, well, uh, athletes like uh, Olympic athletes and, and such uh, have great uh, well-developed sense of kinesthesia. So the idea when you're writing is to use as much sensory content as possible. Um, this is because as human beings we tend to give uh, we tend to give priority to the visual sense 
And this, a technical term for that is ocular centrism. It's a, a fancy word for being centered on the sense of vision, ocular centrism. As human beings, we are ocular centric. We tend to give precedence to the sense of vision. But, uh, and so that conveys to writing. And, but to make our writing more powerful, more compelling, we should try to draw from a range of senses. All right, so not only what we're seeing, but what we're hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, uh, and how we move through a particular place uh, around a particular um, environment. All right, so think of the six senses, but in reality, uh, there are many more senses. There's a sense of time. There's a sense of memory. Um, there's a sense of, of heat, even. Um, thermoception, I think, is a technical term for that sense. So the senses are, are fascinating, and we're going to, to look at um, how we can write through those senses. So let's begin with the sense of vision. Sense of sight tends to be regarded as the most complex, highly developed, and important sense for human beings. Um, sight is closely linked to perception and knowledge. Cognition is, the, is knowledge, is um, uh, consciousness, is processing of information. So thinking and acquiring knowledge for us is very, very much linked to uh, that process, is very much linked to sight, the information we garner through our sense of vision. And if we think of the scientific tradition, sight is also very important. So, for example, uh, species tend to be identified through their visual characteristics. Maybe you've taken a botany course, and uh, in order to identify a plant, you cat um, categorize its visual attributes. All right, so sight is very closely connected. Um, what I would like you to do in this exercise for five minutes is write what your non-human sees. So you've selected a non-human from your list, and you're now trying to write from the perspective of your non-human and what your non-human sees. Your non-human might see you. Your non-human might see your room, whatever it may be. Now, as you're writing, don't feel like you have to write a poem immediately from scratch. You want to do what's known as free writing. Just write what comes to mind because later you can craft it into a poem. So don't feel inhibited. Uh, don't feel self-conscious. Just write what comes to mind freely. So let's do that for five minutes. What does your non-human see?
Good evening, sir. Okay, so what does your non-human see? And as you're writing, um, adopt that I perspective, right? So I see this human being speaking back to me. I see uh, a table uh, in the corner of the room, right? So you're adopting the first person perspective of that non-human. Uh, so we've got some great responses in the chat. Um, uh, Rupsa has some so uh, very very good response there. Uh, the, the the position is very much from the I. I know I'm not afraid of the strength that their bestial owner. I'm exponentially stronger, right? So it's from the perspective of the non-human. Very very good there. So you have considered what your non-human sees. Let's move on to what your non-human hears. Now the sense of sound is very technical, right? Sound is a series of pressure waves. Sound waves are made by objects that are vibrating. Um, so sound is very much about vibration. When we think of sound, we can think of three qualities, the volume, whether it's loud or quiet, the pitch, whether it's a high sound or a low sound. And some animals, for example, can hear very high sounds that are outside of our um, auditory range. Uh, the timber, so texture or character of the sound as well. So there, there are three main qualities. Um, and, and scientists have explored the world of sound. Uh, Galileo considered sound uh, as air ruffled, right? So the way that the ruffled air impacts the ear, right? So sound is, sound is very much vibration, but um, there have been some studies, interestingly, uh, about plants and how they can actually hear. They have the ability to uh, not only hear, but also to use sound. So um, the roots of some plants actually listen for water by, uh, listen to water sources underground. So they, they keep their ears open, their plant ears. Um, a plant called a rock cress can distinguish between the sound of a caterpillar chewing and the wind. So plants can distinguish between sounds. Um, and a recent study published uh, in the New York Times has shown that plants emit sound. So plants use sound um, to express their state of stress. So plants that need water or have had their stems cut produce higher um, levels of sound. I'll give you just an example here. This is a sound of a tomato plant that has not received enough water. This is the tomato plant expressing that it has not received enough water. Right. So uh, it's like a clicking sound uh, or even like knuckle cracking sound. 
So that what scientists have shown is that that sound slows down when the plant is less stressed, when it has been watered or when it's in a healthy state. So plants not only perceive sound, they emit sound. So you could you could say that plants have their own language, their own voice. Um, OK, so with that in mind, uh, what does your non-human hear? So let's take a few minutes now and answer the question. What does your non-human hear? Okay, so you've had a chance to write about what your non-human sees and what your non-human hears. Uh, guess what is next? Does your non-human smell? So uh, sense of smell is very connected to memory and emotion, right? So uh, that's because smell actually resides, the sense of smell actually resides in the very ancient part of the brain known as the limbic system. And so smell memory often is, uh, is very powerful. Um, so olfaction is the technical uh, term for smell. And um, a, a writer named Proust was very good at writing about the sense of smell. And he said that uh, these senses are more faithful they remain poised a long time, like souls remembering. So in your own experience, uh, maybe you have, for example, been walking in a botanical garden and you've smelled a, uh, much like the, the woman pictured there, you've smelled a particular flower and it's brought back a memory from years ago. And that memory seems especially poignant 
seems especially strong. Um, that is because smell is linked to the ancient part of our brain. So what does your non-human smell? What does your non-human smell? Let's, uh, let's take a few minutes now and contemplate that. Okay, so you've had a few minutes to think about what your non-human smells in its environment. So we've covered what your non-human sees, what your non-human hears, what your non-human smells, and now what does your non-human taste? Taste is also powerfully connected to memory. Your memory of certain foods will be very, very strong right? Uh, it will bring back a particularly poignant type of memory. That's because taste and smell are once again connected to that very ancient part of the brain. There are, are five basic tastes, right? Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, 
the fifth tends to be called uh, savory or umami, which is a Japanese word. Uh, savory, for example, uh, matcha tea or miso soup, if uh, this Japanese soup called miso uh, is, is umami, it's savory, it's, it's the fifth taste. So think of those different characters and qualities of taste. But of course, in English, the idea of taste is prominent, right? So to have taste uh, refers to an expression of preferences and the ability to discern between qualities. So I have a taste for uh, expensive wine, or I have a taste for high fashion. I have a taste for quiet country living. Right, so that ability to discern between qualities and express preferences is uh, referred to as taste. So we have taste in the sense of tasting food, tasting flavors, right? But also taste in this other sense of of, dis of a discerning ability to discern. Um, so there's to evoke taste in writing requires. Uh, some practice, and it's good to see how other authors do this. Uh, so this is a writer named Gary Nabhan, a United States writer. He's writing about the taste of corn, mouth-watering texture of a steam-roasted mass of creamy corn kernels, right? So mouth-watering texture, that kind of evokes our salivary glands, right? Gets them uh, prompted steam roasted mass so we can see the steam we can even start to taste that sweet corn uh, and then the final word choice there creamy corn kernels it's a repetition of the c sound or the k the hard k sound uh, creamy corn kernels that adds a kind of rhyme or sorry a, a rhythm to the writing that ties into expressing that sense of taste, right? And making that expression of taste stronger. Okay, so that's a sh just a brief example. Uh, during the pandemic, the loss of taste became an issue for many people. And the technical term for that is agusia, complete loss of taste, uh, and also hypogusia, reduced loss, the reduced sense of taste. So um, this was probably not a phenomenon that was widespread before the pandemic. Then with COVID-19 impacting people's sense of taste, it became uh, much more of a widespread experience. So uh, that leads us to the question of what does your non-human taste if your non-human can taste something? Now, extend your imagination. What does your non-human taste?
Okay, and finally, uh, the sense of touch. So we've looked at what your non-human sees, hears, smells, and tastes. And now the question is, what does your non-human feel? Uh, and so there are lots of words for touch, of course, in the English language. Uh, the sensations that we have when we touch something, hard, soft, rough, smooth, slick, tickling, um, lots of others, of course. There's also the idea of being touched, right? Of being moved, of being affected, of being uh, impacted positively. So we are touched, we are moved by something, by someone's words, whatever it may be. Uh, Margaret Atwood is a uh, short story writer uh, from Canada and who has a very powerful statement on the sense of touch. She says that touch comes before sight, before speech. It is the first language and the last, and it always tells the truth. We can think of uh, the infant in the womb for whom touch is the most powerful in primary sense, right? Before um, the eyes develop, before the ears develop fully, um, before the first food is eaten, uh, taken through the mouth. Uh, the sense of touch is the most uh, most essential, the most uh, powerful, and that develops a relationship, of course, uh, with the mother. So that's, I believe, what Margaret Atwood is referring to. Um, there are technical terms for the loss of touch. Hypesthesia is reduced sensation, and paresthesia is abnormal sensation. These are medical terms that refer to uh, disturbances of the sense of touch. Okay, so with that, and this is the final exercise, I'd like you to write about what your non-human feels in its environment. And also in relation to touch is movement. So how does your non-human move? What does your non-human feel when it moves around? All right, so let's take a few minutes to write about that. Okay, so we are are moving towards towards the end here and You've written about these senses, so you have uh, material on what your non-human sees, hears, tastes, smells, and feels. The process of drafting and redrafting is very, very important. So what I'd like you to do is review what you've written so far and select some particularly striking images or phrases or sentences or paragraphs, well, stanzas in the case of poetry, and try to rework the material 
for clarity. Rework it into a poem. Um, shape what you've what you've written. So it may be the case of of highlighting uh, some lines or phrases that you particularly like, and then reworking those phrases and images into a poem. Now, a poem can be rhymed or it can be unrhymed, um, but um, begin to shape what you've written across those five exercises into a poem, right? And uh, the aim is, of course, to adopt the perspective of your non-human. So maintaining that I, that is the perspective of your non-human. So let's take uh, a couple minutes. This is something that you can pursue um, after the workshop as well, and, and just generally in, in your writing career. Um, but drafting and redrafting is absolutely critical to all forms of writing. So just take a minute now and uh, and reflect on how you could rework what you've written into a poem. All right, everyone. So now is the time for you to shine if you like. Uh, I have, uh, I would like to give you the opportunity to read any of your work. So an open mic reading nature poetry. And um, you are, it's not compulsory, of course, it's completely uh, optional. Uh, but if you'd like to read, what I suggest is um, just write your name or do the do the uh, hand sign, you know, raise your hand on the chat. But it may be easier for me to see if you just write your name in the chat. And if you um, would like to read something, just unmute your mic and you are welcome to read. So um, would anyone like to take the opportunity now to read either a passage or an excerpt of what you've written or your whole poem, um, let me know in the chat. Any brave souls? Volunteers are warmly welcome. Absolutely. 
Very welcome. Uh, Sri Tanwi, please, uh, please, you're very welcome to read. Uh, just unmute your mic and I will uh, stop the share there. Unmute your mic and the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone. I think I'm audible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, due to a poor network connection, I cannot connect to my video, but uh, I'm reading a poem. Uh, this was published uh, in 2021 in one of the web magazines called the Gorkha Times. So I'm just reading this poem now. The name of the poem is The Dusty Lane and Gulmohar. Gulmohar is the Indian Gulmohar uh, plant, which is orange in color. And so I'm just reading this. The Dusty Lane and the Gulmohar. The April summer evening was like any other day in Kolkata. Across the serrated landscapes of the dust ridden lanes, yellow taxis, maroon moose pavements that sifted the grain clock hour through the lens of my mother's eyes. The dust settled in the crematorium just across the blind lane where the bulbuls babbled and the bobbing bosom of the flower woman convulsed into a mirage. Long stood the Gulmohar tree in an empty city canvas freckled with dust orange inflorescence radiating a hidden hue, dust on the coolie's wavy forehead, dust from the rotten heels of the dream peddler who caroused about Kolkata in flashlights and Kolkata in vain. As the evening waited with bated breath for the gully child to resume his cricket match, the dust of the city poured into the divine Ganges, scattering, creating heaps and piles of a long lost imprint of feet that remain in the threshold and voices that churn out of Amaratva. Thank you. Kolkata is a city in India. Wow, thank you so much, Sri Tanwi. Beautiful poem uh, evoking Kolkata and the river yes. and a uh, wonderful evocation yes, of place. Ganges is a river. Ganges is a river that we have in India. And uh, this was actually a city poem that, uh, um, you know, it included the dust from the roads and the uh, myriad of images that we see in nature around us. Often they are not looked into, but while we just pass on, we move on. These uh, small trinkets of images, they keep appearing in our senses. Trinkets and, you know, the uh, parts and bits of images that keep on hovering through our senses. Mm. Oh, thank you and so much for sharing. Is alive. Yes. 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 You brought the city to our minds. You you uh, evoked it very well. So thank you for sharing that. Sri thank Tanwi. you. Thank you. Thanks. It was very nice attending the session. I could learn so much. Thank you. Thank you for for coming. And so uh, we have another volunteer reader. So Navratra, please. Uh, please open your mic and read when you're ready. Thank you, Navratri. Uh, am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> okay, so I will be reading my uh, published poem, which is recently got published in spillwords.com. The poem is Thank You. So thank you are more than words. It's a full sentence, which stands out of all, costlier than finance. Thank you are the words not very hard to say. But believe me, people find it the best price to pay. Thank you is defined as an expression of gratitude, keeping all negative aside without showing attitude. Words can change the meaning. It is rightly said. There's always a difference in what to accept and what is bad. So here we go to add a no in front of our big thank you. We don't need your favor, though it's really nice of you. Some people find it hard to say thank you. I don't know why. Maybe they are rude or maybe a bit shy. But here I am, out of that weird list. Thank you for everything, even for reading this. Fantastic. Thank you, Navratra. Beautiful poem, a rhyming poem. Uh, in, in That's a, a distinctive part of the poem. And I was thinking of this recently about the uh, how thank you is a, a simple yet powerful gesture, and it can really change so many things, just a simple thank you. Uh, so thank you for the poem. Yeah, wonderful to see two 
two uh, different poems side by side to see the range of, of what's possible in poetry. Great. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Any any other readers? Anyone like to read? Yes, of course. Uh, please, our next reader is uh, Sabut Sarkar. Please uh, open your mic and read when you're ready. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay. Fine. Good evening, everyone. And this is Shobud Sharkar, and it's a tiny poem, Whispers. As mild as the backbenchers make in a crowded classroom, I hear the morning breeze disturbed my lazy, crumpled bed. My drowsy, tired eyes snooze, keeping the bed tea off. A gentle prayer for the past, a humble urge to undo the present, frightened for another new morning, brushing with death and bombshells, rape of a girl in a distant village, delay the birth of a happy morning, birds ch chirp anxiously, lest the hooligans bang their guns for nothing. The gets cold, whispers melt. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sapuj Sarkar. Beautiful contemplative meditative poem about uh, everyday life, right? The tea that's getting cold, the sounds of uh, the village around one. So poetry can be very much about the everyday, but the power of poetry is to make the everyday that much more real, even uh, surreal at times. And so that's why uh, those details are so important in a poem. So thank you. Thank you for Thank your... you so much. Thank you, John. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have uh, Rupsa, please. Uh, you're very welcome to read. Please unmute your mic and the floor is yours. Good evening. Hi. Hello. Loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah. So I too have a poem published in the Telegraph, but I thought I would do as you said, and I and I kind of collaborated all the stuff that I wrote in the last half hour. So I would like to read that out. Okay. I am an ant. I scale the grounds of the swarm until huge cauldrons of liquid gold threaten to swallow me whole. I dare not look back into them. They keep staring, but I dare not move closer. I know I'm not afraid of their bestial owner because I believe in my own strength. And yet, I dare not look again. I am an ant. I hear it is raining outside and usher all my friends in. I think I might go into the kitchen looking for a bite because my human is making onion fritters and so perfect is their crackle in the oil. And for as perfect this food of any kind is, I still have always had a taste for true friendship. My community moves in colonies, making me hate the screams of my human when she cries in her sleep, her heartbreaking want of escape from loneliness. I think I might be her next friend. I would take her on a ride to the beautiful leaves and their fancy fair of branches. I would want to feel her smile in the bones of my boneless body. There you go. I am an ant, and this is my story. Thank you. Fantastic, Ripsa. So, so many great images there and expressions, the bones of my boneless body, right? And so you really, you really occupy that perspective of, of the ant and uh, uh, all the detail that an ant might encounter right the the uh, uh, as it navigates your home environment so oh fantastic i really really appreciate your sharing that rupsa thank you i'm so glad you liked it great thank you uh, a good example of a persona poem uh can i read but from a, a other author poem certainly uh teresa please uh welcome you're welcome to read when you're ready Uh, yes, if uh, Teresa, if you could um, perhaps 
Um, speak a little louder. It's a little bit faint. Yes. I will turn off my Bluetooth. I think this makes a uh, noisy. That's okay, better. how about now, sir? That's much how better. About now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. much better. Thank you. I will read the poem of Dalton Abar. Uh, sorry for I cannot open my camera. The cry of the bird was heard, celebrating a new day. This natural beauty keeps me going like the world for me. Let me close my eyes for a moment. I hold my hand for a moment. Calm, quiet, happy to feel. Made me feel happy. He is the creator of nature. My admiration is hard for me. From noon to night, his magic never came out. Wind rim rises in the mountains. The plains dance on the mountains. It was so beautiful. Look at the beautiful paradise in heaven. The beauty of nature was perfect. Makes everything start with it. Everyone was amazed. But we have to take care of it. Never will see my be beautiful. That's all. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Teresa, for sharing that beautiful poem, beautiful inspirational poem. Yeah. Uh, would anyone else like to uh, read or if you have any any comments you'd like to share? Um, absolutely. Let's just go back to the chat. Is it OK to read her poem that we just made from the exercise? Yes, absolutely. Um, Nasma Shumaranti, please, you're welcome to read uh, if you would like to. Okay, I will try to read my poem that I just write. Yes, please. Can Thank you. Me. Hear me? Uh, yes, you're clear. Okay. okay, wait. Night crickets. I see darkness in tall grass. All of you said it is quiet, but not for me. So many noises in this time. I hate when you guys cooking with time. I'm a free creature. I can go wherever, wherever I want. It is tingling, tingling, but also hard when I land it. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So night cricket, yes, occupying the perspective of the cricket. So great, great example of persona poem. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Mupia, please, you're very welcome to read. Good evening, everybody. Am I audible? Uh, yes, you are. Okay. The poem which I'm going to read out that was published from a delivered publication. And the name is Metamorphic Loveliness. So I am audible? Uh, yes, please. Yeah, we can hear okay. you well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Metamorphic Loveliness. Oh, sky. How vibrant you are. Even in a dark or luminous night, you spread your drunken beauty towards us. I'm totally spellbound. I feel so much calmness. Around me, there exists a serene atmosphere and a gentle breeze flows strong. Oh sky, please tell me your hidden mystery. How you keep your graceful beauty. Like a winged name, I want to be your trusted one. At silent darkness, when all sleep dies, maybe they are having a lot of sweet dreams. But I am imprisoned in your metamorphic loveliness. It attracts me more, sleep has gone, feeling bliss. At a lonely night, I just stared at your ravishing look and give a sigh. I'm unable to give you a little bite. The music of tranquility mixed up with your beauty. Oh, I am sick with your praise. I am in the nature's base. From far behind, I can hear the cricket song. From the mound, I can hear foxes howl. But 
now this gives me an ex exceptional cheer i can feel it with its beautiful visionary pleasure thank you great thank you for sharing that with me and, and i think what i found in your poem is the is the rhythm is very good very uh uh very um rhythmic poem that takes me into the mind of your subject that you're writing about so thank you so much for sharing that we've had such a great range of poems so far um wonderful some rhyming some unrhymed uh some you know, sharing different perspectives so great uh any other readers thank you, sir. yes thank you thanks so much for sharing and um any other readers or any questions or comments or anything uh, as we wrap up today's workshop? I'm happy to answer any questions you may have or um, anything. Okay, aloe vera, poem on aloe vera, please. Navracha, you're welcome to share that, please. Okay, so this is the first draft of my poem because I have just tried to turn it with all the uh, ideas on my mind so i'm sorry if i made any mistake i hope i'm audible oh yes you're clear yes please okay so the poem is i am aloe vera i am aloe vera i also know how hard it is to grow up facing tough times i can feel your pain dear son of adam i also have thorns on my side i can see others with flowers drinking water of happiness up to its brim. But I feel proud to stand erect in a hot, dry climate when even scorching sunlight never gets dim. The reason why I took birth is to help people in curing their pain. But I'm sorry, I don't feel resemblance with human species who measure even love with loss and gain. Thank you. Thank you, Navrata. So a good example of a persona poem from the perspective of an aloe vera, which is a very healing plant uh, and very cooling plant for those of you in the, the very hot part of the Indian uh, summer now. So, uh, wow, I'm so impressed and um, grateful as well uh, for those of you who have taken part today and those of you who have shared your poetry just now. Uh, so I think that with that, we should wrap up today's session and um, I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Gautam Maji, please, to, uh, to wrap up today's session. Thank you, everyone. What should I say? Thank you so much, sir, because we are uh, thoroughly en enjoyed and we are enriched with your wonderful session and the way you have taught us through different kind of exercises and how to look at nature and how to understand nature through our uh, senses. And that you have learned from this uh, workshop. I think that all of them who are present over here, they have had a wonderful enriching experience uh, uh, from this workshop. And um, on this uh, positive note, I think that all of you who are present and uh, who are not present also because we are recording this video. So hopefully we will upload on YouTube. So who have missed this opportunity to be the part of this workshop can get access to this video later, or later on when it will be uploaded on the YouTube. So uh, I, I don't exactly how could I just uh, express my gratitude to Professor John because uh, he was not only a great academician, but a great generous person. And uh, so many things are there. I cannot just uh, reveal to every person right now, but uh, you are a great person and remember that what you are and keep uh, making us uh, learn it in this way uh, with your keep sharing your knowledge with us so that we can learn we can grow uh, and we can do something better in our life and uh Ima, would you like to say on behalf of your uni university uh no i think i still remember one of your students say uh what's it reading the poem entitled thank you Oh, yes, simple yes. Word. <laughs> but think... it's really touching, you know, um, for Absolutely. me, because uh, my background not not exactly from literature, but I can learn 
many things here. So creating poem is not simple, I think, for me. I'm struggling to, to follow um, your workshop, actually, John. And uh, I saw uh, several comments from the chat. Many students and many participants can participate very well. And thank you for doing this um, collaboration, Gautam. Next, we will do again. Thank you. Thank you, Mirma. And uh, on this very note, I'd like to uh, thank to all the participants who have joined and who haven't also, who are in our WhatsApp group. And uh, I will share with you one feedback link on WhatsApp. You can just uh, fill up this one to fetch your certificate for this workshop. So once again, I would like to congratulate as well as I would like to express my gratitude on behalf of all the participants, on behalf of our both institutions, to Professor John for uh, becoming a facilitator of this workshop and enriching us with his wonderful and insightful talks on this uh, creative writing workshop. So thank you so much, sir, for joining, and thank you so much, Ima. Thank you so much, all the participants uh, from different parts of the world uh, to join and uh, make it a grand success. So thank you so much to all of you. And I'm signing, signing it off. Thank you. And hope we will meet you uh, somewhere or the other place uh, in other, another kind of uh, venture. And we will get connected through our WhatsApp group. So kindly fill up the, uh, the feedback form, which I'm going to give you on the WhatsApp. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. OK. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.